So good morning to all. Uh, today's session will be about drugs used for constipation. So before I start regarding the drugs which are used for constipation, I will just give a basic idea of what is constipation, the various criteria which can be used to classify constipation and its causes. And after that, we'll start dealing with the drugs used for constipation. So what is constipation? By definition, constipation is a passage of small heart disease infrequently and with difficulty. Constipation is a significant problem in palliative care population. It not only just limits itself in the palliative care population as such, but it's also present in the general population. And one thing which we need to know about constipation is that constipation is as itself is a symptom, which the patient presents with rarely actually. The patient, uh, most of the time, the patient doesn't complain as uh, complaints of constipation. It is one thing which we obtain from our history taking. Whenever we ask them about their bowel movements, they say that it has been about five days, six days, or one week as such. Now, regarding the prevalence of constipation in our population, nearly 41 percentage of non cancer patients suffer from constipation, and this number increases to 30 to 50 percentage in cancer patients. While when we take care, uh, consider patients who are using opiates, the numbers this is much higher to nearly 80 to 90 percent such now regarding the criteria for constipation we still use the wrong criteria for classifying constipation and a person is said to be suffering from constipation if he has any of the following two symptoms for at least a period of six months these symptoms can be a straining during at least 25 percent of the defications the sensation of anal rectal obstruction at least during 25 percent of the defication see lumpy or hard stools or fewer than three bowel moons per week. The next thing is about Bristol stool chart. Bristol stool chart is one thing which most of the nurses use and we also use in a clinical practice to see the bowel pattern. In this, as you can see, type three and type four are the normal bowel moments. And whenever a patient presents with constipation, it might be in type one and type two. So whatever, what we usually observe is that when the patient comes, we usually help, use the help of this chart to assess their bowel pattern and we uh, educate them about the aim of reaching a bowel movement of type 3 or type 4. Mm -hmm. Now, regarding the etiology of constipation, constipation itself can be categorized into two types, primary constipation and secondary constipation. The primary constipation itself is subdivided into three categories. One is normal transit constipation, the other is low transit constipation, the third is pelvic floor dysfunction. Now, in normal transit constipation, the transit time taken in the bowel, bowel is normal and the patient usually comes with its uh, straining during defecation. And it's much more similar to irritable bowel syndrome. However, the major difference between IBS and normal transit constipation is the lack of abdominal pain in NTC. While in irritable bowel syndrome, the patient usually also presents abdominal pain as such. In slow transit constipation, the bowel transit time is increased a lot and patient usually comes with irregular bowel movements and straining or difficulty during defecation. And in pelvic floor dysfunction, it's as the name suggests, it's a dysfunction in our pelvic floor or an anal sphincter as such, and the patient usually complains of excessive straining during defecation. Now, the thing we must know about in this categorization is that normal trans constipation is the most common type of constipation which we observe. Now, regarding secondary constipation, there are numerous causes which may lead to secondary constipation. I have divided into certain subheadings. We'll go through it briefly as possible. The first is dietary issues. In dietary issues, the things can reasons can be inadequate water intake, inadequate fiber intake, or overuse of coffee, tea, or alcohol. In this, both inadequate water intake and inadequate fiber intake is one of the most common reasons which we see in our palliative care population or in bedbound patients whose food habits has changed and they might present to us with constipation. The other causes are the structural causes, in which there is any local pathology like anal fissures, thrombus, hemorrhoids, or colonic structures or obstructive tumors, etc. Now, coming to systemic diseases, in systemic diseases, as based on it, totally we have classified this further subdivided further categories. The first is metabolic and endocrine disorders, in which diabetes and hypothyroidism is one of the most common causes. And metabolic disorders like hypercalcemia and hypokalemia also can precipitate in constipation. Neurological disorders like stroke, Parkinson's disease, spinal cord lesions, multiple sclerosis also can precipitate constipation as such. And when we take, talk about connective tissue disorders, scleroderma and amyloidosis are two such disorders which may cause constipation. And regarding medications, medication is one of the most common causes of constipation as such, and we must take extra care in finding out what all medications the patient is going on whenever he presents with constipation. Some of the medications are antidepressants, like cyclic antidepressants, MAO inhibitors, then metals like iron, bismuth, 
and anticholinergics like benzotropin and triexifen can also cause constipation. And calcium channel blockers like verapamil is also one of the medications which can cause constipation and such. Now, in this slide, I believe all these medication one which we most commonly use in our practice, like opioids, like codeine and morphine has causes constipation irregularly, and that's why as a dictum, whenever we are prescribing morphine, we have to write laxity along with it. One thing we must note is that more opioids like Antanil and methadol has got lesser incidental cause of constipation. Then NSAIDs like ibuprofen and diclofenac also can cause constipation. And as it's asymptomatic, like pseudoephedrine can also result in constipation. Now, regarding the drugs used for constipation, the drugs which we use for managing constipation are called as laxatives. And based on the mechanism, actual laxatives can, can be categorized into bulk forming agents like nitrofibrin, psyllium, stagular, stool softeners like docusates and liquid paraffin. Stimulant laxatives like bisacodyl, sodium picosulfate, senna, and osmotic laxatives like lactose and macrogons. Now, the mechanism of action of most laxatives is that it increases the water content of a fecal method. This can be either by the osmotic action, in which there's a retention of water and electrolytes in the intestinal lumen as such, or it can act on our intestinal mucus and decrease the net absorption of water and electrolytes, which in turn causes the increase in water content of the fecal method. Certain laxatives also increase the propulsive activity as its primary mode of action. And most of the laxatives doesn't have just a single mechanism of action and has got a mixed mechanism of action based on the dosage at which we are prescribing laxatives. Now, the first group of laxatives which we will be talking about is bulk laxatives. Under bulk laxatives, dietary fibers like Brian R1, which will come. These dietary fibers are products of the cell wall, which are usually not digested in our body. Now, the mechanism of action of the buck laxative is that they absorb water in our intestine and in turn, this in turn increases the water content of the fecal material. It also supports the bacterial growth and colon, which contributes to the fecal mass. Now, the major drawback with dietary fiber is that a large quantity needs to be ingested for its laxative action, and it doesn't soften any fecal material that is already present. That means that once we start using the dietary fiber, it only softens the fecal matter which is being formed. And if the patient is suffering from constipation prior to that, it has no effect on that. Hence, dietary fiber can be prescribed as a prevention method of constipation and not for the management of constipation as such. The next group of drugs is psyllium. Psyllium is also a bulk laxative. Its mechanism of action is that it forms a bulky gelatinous mass by absorbing water and it increases the bacterial mass and softens the fecal material as such. Usually, psyllium is indicated in colostomy and elastomy regulation in case of anal fissure, hemorrhoids, diverticular disease, and IBS as such. The major adverse effect which we can see with psyllium is flatulence, abdominal dysfunction, fecal infection, and bowel obstruction. The next category of drug is methyl cellulose, which is also comes in the bulk form of laxatives. It's a semi-synthetic colloidal hydrophilic derivative of cellulose. And one thing we need to know of methyl cellulose is that it is largely unfermented colloid. Now, one major advantage of bulk laxity is that it can be used for regularizing the bowel, the consistency of bowel fecal material in case of colostrum patients as such, who might sometimes present with liquid stools as such. So in this patient, we can consider adding a bulk laxity stool. Now, the next category of drugs are stool softeners, which uh, laxity are stool softeners. And under stool softeners, the first one is deposit sodium. The major indication of deposit sodium is constipation, hemorrhoids, anal tissue, and for bowel preparation for any abdominal radiography and also in partial bowel obstruction. Its mechanism of action is that it acts on our industrial mucosa and causes water accumulation, which in turn increases the penetration of water into the fecal materials. The usual onset of action of docosate sodium is from 12 to 72 hours. One thing which we need to note about docosate sodium is that it usually disrupts the mucosal barrier and enhances the absorption of other non absorbable drugs. Hence, whenever we are like liquid paraffin, so usually we don't prefer adding prescribing both the drugs at the same time as it can't increase the absorption of liquid paraffin because unregulated bowel mode for these patients. Now, the major adverse effects of deficit sodium is diarrhea, nausea, abdominal cramps, and hepatotoxicity. The dose which we prescribe deficit sodium is 100 milligram DD, which can be further hiked to 200 milligram twice a day or thrice a day based on the response of the patient. Now, liquid paraffin is another stool softener. Liquid paraffin is one of the most commonly prescribed stool softener in our practice. It's a pharmacologically inert substance, and its mechanism of action is that it softens the stool and retards water absorption, which in turn increases the water content of the fecal material. It has also got a lubricant action, which 
further facilitates easy bowel movements. The dosage at which we prescribe ukiparafen is from 15 to 30 ml per day. That's based on the response of the patient. If the patient doesn't respond to 15 ml per day, we can further hydrate 30 ml per day, and we can further increase dose as per the need. We, now, the adverse effect which we commonly relate found to have with ukiparafen is that it can decrease the absorption of vitamin A, D, K, the fat-soluble vitamins, and in bedbound patients or bedridden patients, sometimes lipoinivonitis lipo can happen due to aspiration of lipid paraffin. And it's, it's not advised to uh, prescribe lipid paraffin for bedridden patients as such. Now, the next category of laxatives are stimulant laxatives. The major mechanism of action of most of the stimulant laxatives are as follows that it increases the gastric motility by acting on the mantle plexus. And in some, there is also another mechanism of action just I mentioned. This is by accumulation of water and electrolytes in that lumen. This can either by this can be achieved either by inhibiting the sodium potassium ATPase at the basolateral membrane of the villus cell, which in turn alters the absorption of water and electrolytes, or it can be by increased prostaglandin synthesis or the activation of cyclic K in the cells, which in turn causes enhanced secretion of water and electrolytes in the cell. Now, stimulant laxatives has got further supplies. One is diphenyl methanes, under it comes bisacordal, which is also one of the most commonly used laxatives. One thing which we need to know about bisacordal is that it's a pro drug as such. And its mechanism of action is that after being a product, it gets activated in your intestine by deacetylization process. After getting activated, it irritates our colonic mucosa to increase the fluid secretion and stimulates the enteric neurons to promote the resistances as such. The major advantage of this is that it can be administered both orally and as a suppository and is absorbed in your intestine. Its excretion is by our bile itself. Now, one adverse effect which we usually see with bisacordylase is in a suppository form in which it causes a local rectal inflammation. Regarding the dosage of bisacordyl, the dosage which we prescribe is from 10 to 20 mg per night, which based on the response can be high further, high to 20 mg twice a day as such. The next group of stimulant laxative is the sodium picosulfate. Similar to bisacordyl, sodium picosulfate is also a prodrug and it's also hydrolyzed by a colonic bacteria into the active form. The mechanism of action of sodium picosulfate is that it irritates the mucosa, which in turn activates the myelin neuron and promotes peristalsis, and which in turn leads to a bowel movement. Usually, a bowel movement happens after 6 to 12 hours after initial dose of sodium picosulfate, and the dosage of sodium picosulfate is from 5 to 10 mg at night, which can be further hiked to 30 mg. The next group of stimulant exit is androcanons, under which Senna comes. Senna itself is an inactivate glycoside and it passes unobserved and unchanged to a small intestine. It gets hydrolyzed by the bacterial glycosidases in the large intestine gets activated. The mechanism of action of Senna is that it acts, its active principle stimulates our mind process, which in turn increases peristalsis. It also decreases segmentation as such. Another uh, form of action is that it promotes secretions and inhibits salt and water absorption in our colon. The adverse effect which we usually correlate with Senna is skin rashes, Takes a drug absorption and melanosis coli. The dosage of Senna is 50 mg HS, which can be further hiked to 30 mg twice a day. And when we are increasing the dosage of Senna, we usually go start with 50 mg, then we hike it to 22.5 mg, and then we hike it to 30 mg twice a day. The next category of drugs are osmotic laxatives, in which lactose comes. Lactose is one of the most commonly prescribed laxatives, not only in the palliative field itself, but also in the gastroenterology and hepatology as such. Now, when you come deal with lactose, lactose is a semi-synthetic disaccharide of fructose and lactose. And its mechanism of action is that it deposits a large volume of fluid in our large intestine, which promotes peristalsis. It gets fermented in our large intestine into its acetic, formic, and lactic acid, in which in turn increases fecal acidity. This also in turn stimulates peristalsis. The major adverse effect which we find in use of lactose is fat lens, cramps, and nausea. And lactose itself is counter indicating intestinal obstruction and galactosine. Now, whenever we are speaking of lactose, we must also know about its mechanism of action and its role in hepatic encephalopathy. Lactose is one of the preferred drugs in hepatic encephalopathy. It has got a multiple mechanisms of actions for use in hepatic encephalopathy. One is that the acidic breakdown product of lactose lowers the pH of stools. This in turn discourages the proliferation of ammonia producing organisms. And this reduction in production of ammonia helps in dealing with hepatic encephalopathy. It also reduces the absorption of ammonium ions and other nitrogenous compounds as such. 
Other group of osmotic laxatives are macrogols or polyethylene glycols. This mechanism of action is that it has got an osmotic action in our industrial and it increases the fecal volume. Macrogols are unchanged and absorbed in our GI tract as such, and it reduces the colonic bacterial flora, unlike lactams. The adverse effect which we usually see in macrogols are abdominal bloating, discomfort, and rarely an electrolyte shift is seen in some certain patients, though not common. And similar to lactose, macrogols are also contraindicated in bowel obstruction. And it's also contradicted in severe inflammatory bowel conditions as such. Now, magnesium salts are one of the or other group of osmotic laxatives, and its mechanism of action is by release of polycystopenia, which in turn promotes peristalsis. It also decreases absorption or increases secretions in a small bowel. And regarding its adverse effect, there is a slight risk of hypermagnesium in patients who are taking magnesium salts. And we must take care in patients who have renal impairment who are doing prescribed magnesium salts. Magnesium salts, as such, are not prescribed, and this combination of magnesium salts and liquid paraffin are usually prescribed for patients. So, that a dual mechanism of action, like osmotic laxative and a stool salt, can work and help in relieving constipation in such patients as such. Now, whenever a patient who doesn't respond to our oral laxatives, the next step is to start the monorectal products. These extra products can both be a suppository or as an enema as such. Regarding indication, like I mentioned earlier, the indication of starting rectal products are constipation, fecal infection, even after oral laxatives are found to be ineffective. Now, suppositories, uh, which we prefer, are glycerol suppository and bisacryl suppository. Glycerol suppository has got a hygroscopic action as well as a lubricant action. Well, this oil being a stimulant laxative has got a local action and stimulates the propulsive activity after hydrolyzable enteric enzymes as such. As I mentioned earlier, this oil is supposed to be major adverse effect is rectal inflammation. And microanimals are the other uh, thing, rectal measures which can be used for management of constipation. In microanimals, they can have multiple mechanisms of action. It can be osmotic, which contains sodium citrate, sodium lauryl, sulfur citrate, glycerol, or sorbitol. But it can be a fecal softener like docusid sodium. Standard animals are also there, and there is also osmotic microanimals which contain phosphate products as such. Now, when we go to the newer agents in uh, laxatives, these are methyl naltrexone, naloxone combination, naloxagol, lubiprestone, laxitidol, and procalopride. So when you come to methyl naltrexone, methyl naltrexone itself is not uh, can replace the existing laxatives, and it's only used for augment the laxatives which are in, already in use. That means that whenever the patient is not responding to the normal laxatives, even after titrating its doses, rectal products, we can uh, use methyl naltrexone, but not to replace the existing laxative, but to augment its action. The mechanism of action of methyl naltrexone is that it's a mu receptor anticoagulant, and this major advantage is that it doesn't close the blood-brain barrier, but acts on the opioid receptors in gut, and hence the pain, the effectiveness of pain. Uh, there is no reversal in pain of, on the action of pain receptors by the usage of methyl naltrexone. One thing to note is that methyl naltrexone is used as a subcutaneous injection, and its adverse effects are abdominal pain, diarrhea, flatulence, nausea. Methyl naltrexone itself is contraindicated in bowel obstruction. The other newer agent which is available now in management laxative is procalopride. Procalopride is a 5 ht 4 agonist. It also acts as a stimulant laxative. The mechanism of action of procalopride is that it activates the 5 ht 4 receptor on our intrinsic enteric neurons and it enhances the release of acetylcholine, which prop uh, propagates the movement of fecal material to our colon. The major side effect which we see with procalopride is headache, dizziness, fatigue, abdominal pain, and diarrhea. Lubiprestone is another newer agent present for management of laxatives. Lubiprestone is a prostrogenic analog, and its mechanism of action is EP4 receptor agonist, which in turn activates the mucosal chloride channels. This causes increased chloral intestinal fluid, which, acts, which in turn accelerates the colonic transfer. Another thing is it delays the gastric emptying time, which in promotes further movement of bowel movements. The adverse effect which we usually associate with lubiprestone is nausea, dyspepsia, and diarrhea. Naloxagol is another newer agent present in the management of uh, constipation. It's a peripheral opioid receptor antagonist, and the usual dose at which we prescribe naloxagol is 12.5 12, 12 milligram per orally daily, which can be further hiked to 25 milligram per orally. 
Naloxone is usually indicated for treatment for opioid induced constipation in adults patients with non cancer pain. And a special care must be done in patients of suffering from renal impairment and especially in end stage renal disease where the dose reduction must be done. We can initially start with 12.5 milligrams for patients who are suffering from end stage renal disease. And if they're able to tolerate the dosage of 12.5 milligram, we can further hike it to 25 milligram. The adverse effects associated with naloxone is abdominal pain, flatulence, headache, diarrhea, and nausea. And just as I mentioned, other laxative is also contraindicated in substituted, suspected GI obstruction. Lacetinol is another newer laxative. It's a, when we uh, categorized based on mechanism action, it is similar to lactose and it comes under an osmotic laxative. The major side effect associated with lacetrol is abdominal distension, flat lens, cramps, dyspepsia, nausea, and walk. All the newer mentioned agents are currently available in India, but its costs are much more expensive rather than the usual uh, laxative agents which we use. So, this is a basic pathway of uh, management of constipation. As such, this doesn't deal with palliative care and just deals with usual functional constipation. So, whenever we suspect functional constipation, the symptoms, uh, the features might be more or less than three bowel movements per week or a hard lumpy stool, like which the Bristol school chart comes under one or two, or there's a straining in defecation or defic uh, incomplete evacuation, sensation incomplete evacuation in a rectal bowel defecation. When a patient comes with such symptoms, the first thing which we must look at is there a features of colorectal cancer in first degree related. If or unintended weight loss, bleeding, or sudden change in bowel level. If a patient has such symptoms, then it would be better to, for a gastrointestinal referral in order to rule out a malignancy and such. So the first thing which we usually do is a physical examination in both, both abdominal, perineal region, and anal regions are examined. And we have to also look for the secondary causes, like whether he's on any other medications or has got other uh, concurrent medical conditions like diabetes, hypoth hypothyroidism, and such. And we must also elicit a history in which we know about the patient's usual bowel movement and bowel pattern as such, and whether there has been any changes in his bowel habits or dietary habits and the normal level of exercise and stress involved. And based on that, we have got a specific approach. If it's a slow chronic transit, which has got a defining features of very infrequent bowel movement and yang movement or absent of urging or defecation, we give the laxity as such. And in irritable bowel syndromes, the defining feature will be abdominal cramps or uh, pain or bloating. And we usually start with the oxymotic laxative and we can add linaclotide or procalopride, which are newer laxative agents. We can also add a pain modifying agents like uh, TCS and spasmodics. In patients who are having difficulty dysfunction, the defining features will be difficulty to pass tools or prolonged exercise training. And there will be a history of anal surgery or obstructive surgery. In such patients also, it will be better to uh, refer them to gastrointestinal constipation. The next thing which we will be dealing about is opioid induced constipation, which is one of the major things which we deal in our OPDA or IP practice as such. So whenever a patient presents with opioid induced constipation, the first thing which we must uh, know is about the patient's bowel habit and whether he uses laxatives regularly. One thing which we usually commonly seen is that patient may not be taking laxatives regularly and as uh, such due to constipation, he might reduce the use of opioids and may present with severe pain to us. And if you don't elicit a proper history, we might in turn further worsen the constipation by hiking the laxity dosage, by hiking the, the dosage of opioids. So after eliciting a history of the patient, we must uh, palpate, uh, do an abdominal examination where we can palpate for any fecal mass and also a rectal examination. And by dietary advices, we usually encourage the patient to drink high amount of fluids and fruit juices and fruits as such, so that there's an increased dietary intake, fiber intake in this diet. And the usual dictum is that whenever we start a patient of any opioids, we usually prescribe a laxative along with it. And the laxative usually which we prescribe is a stimulant laxative, like bisacotyl, like Belflex or a sodium picosulfate. Bisacotyl, when the patient is not constipated initially, we start with a usual level of 5 milligram HS, which can be further increased to 10 milligram HS after 24 to 48 hours. If the patient himself is constipated, we can start with 10 milligram HS dosage and if there is no response we can hike it to 20 milligram per night after a waiting period of 24 to 48 hours. If we are starting him on Senna and there's sorry 
we are starting him on Sunav and this is not constipated, we can start him with a dosage of 50 milligram HS and we can further hike it to 50 milligram BD dosing after a time period of 24 to 48 hours. However, if he starts, the patient presented, presents a constipation itself, we have to start with a 50 milligram BD dosing. And if there is no response, we hike it to 22.5 milligram BD, which can be further hiked to 30 milligram after every 24 to 40 hours, hours if there is no response. The next thing which we must note is that if the max and also stimuli like say TAV is found to be ineffective, we usually add a stool softness like liquid paraffin. And another thing to note is that if the patient has more than three days of constipation, like since his last bowel moment, we usually give a suppository. And even if these are in ineffective, we go for administer enema. And we must only really consider methyl naltrexone if there if there is failure to, uh, of response, even after adequately treated doses of oral laxatives and rectal interventions. The next thing which we must note is about patient education. So in patient education, we usually discuss the issues of privacy or comfort with the patient. Uh, one thing which we can usually find is the patient might be, they might have a usual regular bowel movement in their home, home and whenever they get admitted, they present a constipation due to a change in environment and changing comfort in using the, the lab, the facilities available. Other thing is we must also uh, educate them of the regulatory, uh, regularity of daily rhythm and toilet seating and position. Also, we must elicit and address their fears while, pass, uh, while regarding constipation of bleed. This might be of bleeding fear and they might themselves withhold fluids and food due to anxiety of being dependent of other people for defecation. This is one thing which you usually see in patients who are bed bound or or bedridden as such, and they feel like there is loss of independence in their daily activities, and they must be dependent on other people or the caregivers for passing a ball moments, and might stop themselves from having high fluid diet or, or fiber rich diet or take laxatives as such. You must also be able to elicit and respond to their dignity concerns. Position support must also be given to such patients, and we must also provide an access to commode in certain patients. The references which I took for this presentation are from Oxford Textbook of Palliative Medicine, Essential of Biomedical Pharmacology, Palliative Care Formulary, Reducing Palliative Care by Robert Cyprus and Andrew Willow, and the British Columbia Interprofessional Palliative Center Management Guidelines, and the National Cancer uh, Guidelines, Gates Palliative Care Guidelines and Constitution. Thank you, Arjun. I think would like to take up. Uh, there is one Rajri. You have one comment. Can you open your mic and stay? Say, uh, Madam, uh, peripherally acting new opioid receptor antagonist uh, is a new laxative, which accidentally I found in one of the literature, but it is not available in India. But it the best. Uh, it seems it, it doesn't antagonize the energies here produced by the uh, opioid morphine or uh, uh, fentanyl, whatever it is, but it selectively, uh, you know, relieves constipation. That is what uh, I came to know. I don't know much of the details. Uh, accidentally, I just found it in the literature. So that's why I suggested it as uh, the post. Thank you, madam. Thank you, Rajki. I think it's important. Thank you, Arjun, uh, for a wonderful presentation. Kaitri, please go ahead with the discussion. Uh, uh, thank you, Arjun. Can we show, stop the sh slide sharing, Arjun, if we, we can see you? And Rajeshri, thanks for, for raising this um, uh, concept of uh, Pemora, this uh, peripherally acting new opioid receptor antagonist. It, it in, in encompasses all the opioid antagonist drugs which uh, Arjun already discussed, like naltroxone. Usually they have this combination of uh, naloxone, mor uh, morphine sometimes they use. Uh, these, all antagonist drugs which are used to reverse constipation, like it comes under that. So um, that is a very, they put it as a, a, a um, they call it as PEMOR as, um, as, as a short form. Thanks for bringing this up, Rajeshri. Any other comments which I want to, uh, if you want to bring up, you're sharing your experience. Just we are seeing this every day in the practice. Sometimes they land up in casualty with them. Um, features of intestinal obstruction actually because of such constipation. Many patients, they say, I'm not moved ball for one month. Unbelievable, but sometimes it's, uh, it's such a big issue. But most, most um, health workers, they, they don't realize 
the importance of addressing that issue and we land up seeing in very bad shape. Uh, any other uh, comments? Uh, please put, uh, put if you are very shy to express, put it on the chat. We'll take it up one by one. While we are waiting for the comment, maybe some, uh, some few comments which I thought I'll take from uh, Arjun's presentation. One is like once again reiterating that many of the times when you talk in context of palliative care, bulk laxative is not really recommended because already they have little capacity, they feel bloated all the time because of various reasons. And we add bulk laxative, it aggravates sometimes the problem. And uh, similarly, when we typically all constipation management, if you look at any guideline, not in palliative care, the first thing they emphasize is about all about dietary management. They say without before starting medication, start think about diet, think about high fiber, high a lot of fluids. So that's a standard protocol in all constipation guidelines internationally. But what we have to think about is in palliative care, sometimes we may not be able to implement that because they just don't eat well. So where a patient is not eat, unable to eat, we cannot force on um, um, uh, asking them to eat enough food. So we have to be very careful when we give dietary advice, but we have to remember to give good dietary advice, but mindful of that, our fibers can add to patients' discomfort sometimes. And then another thing which came up in terms of uh, 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 softener and lubricant liquid paraffin, which we use very commonly, uh, many times patients say it didn't work and the very common reason is the quantity which they take. They say what is recommended as Arjun mentioned 15 to 30 ml. So we have to tell them the big teaspoon how you have to take tea, three big teaspoon then only it will be the quantity, sufficient quantity. They don't realize that they just use small two spoon and they just uh, try to have that and that sometimes it doesn't help. I see one chat response. Tramadol is very commonly used in wards. If inquired, the incidence of constipation is high in patients on tramadol would need laxatives. Absolutely. Most uh, health work, uh, physicians, they're very comfortable writing tramadol. So it's a very standard prescription which we see in all wards, all specialties, but they don't remember to add tramadol. I think it should be part of our training when we do uh, training, any training related to pain or, or opioid management, I think we have to emphasize that even if it is tramadol, please remember your laxatives or look for constipation. Absolutely. I really take this point, Dr. Mahajan. Another point which I want to bring in is uh, in terms of stimulant, uh, all, what I, this is what I understood. All stimulant laxative, when it's used in a, a higher dosage, they become osmotic. All osmotic in higher dosage, they stimulate the gut. So eventually mechanism is, as Arjun mentioned, three common mechanism, either increasing the peristalsis or increasing the bulk. So that's something we had to finally remember. Um, again, bisacodyl dose, normally in a normal uh, outside palliative care context, when you use bisacodyl, it is unheard of, like two in the morning, two in the night, two in the afternoon, like such a high dose. But in palliative care, we use it. Remember that because we are using opioids, they need the stimulation around the clock. So this very unconventional dosage, which we, Dr. Um, Arjun mentioned, the high use of bisacodyl. Um, many times opioid induced constipation, which is our area where we face a lot of challenges. We don't know what to do sometimes. We struggle with that. Um, and our, our oncologist would say, doctor, I'm referring one patient. Please don't add morphine. I, I say, why? Yesterday also I got this referral. He's, he's getting constipation. So for them is morphine constipation. So they just, they, they just hate it. So yeah, it, we struggle with all the time. We have many, uh, I want to hear from our seniors, but one thing eventually we try to do, sometimes we land up doing is what we call it as opioid rotation. Uh, we rotate to another opioid if the patient cannot tolerate morphine and it's causing serious um, gut um, opioid induced constipation. And patient education, we just cannot, um, um, we have to emphasize the need for patient education. Many a times, as Arjun mentioned, they come back with constipation because they say, I, I never had constipation. I don't have constipation. That's why I didn't take more constipation medicine. So, and they come back in serious constipation. So these are a few points. And also please remember, we, because our session is on drug induced, drugs used in constipation, we didn't talk about other aspects in detail, like how Arjun mentioned privacy, uh, going for the normal habit and, um, and their lifestyle, all those things which we didn't emphasize. But please remember that that should be a first step towards managing constipation. And 
managing constipation bedridden paraplegic another game, game all game all game all together um and yeah i see some other comments m uh, set with tramadol produce more constipation absolutely because ondan cetron by itself very con so remember all drugs which can on add constipation we have to be aware and commonly used is uh, ondan cetron and uh, adding to the constipation. Role of castor oil in constipation. Arjun, do you have any comments around that, castor oil and constipation? Because it's a very old age, traditional methods of, method of using, uh, dealing with constipation. Uh, I'm, so castor oil is suggested, uh, as you mentioned, since uh, it's an older method of your managing laxative, of uh, managing constipation. And further, now most tools of nurse and lubricants are being used for managing constipation as well. It's, the castor oil can be, a strong sometimes irritant uh, so um, sometimes um, it's not uh, in present day it's not really uh, uh, but they still all households they, they they use all that before they come to us remember that so they would have tried all their own methods and remember that all many herbal and ayurvedic medicines sometimes uh, are good and patients use it so we had to ask that history also. Have you tried anything at home? They find their own ways to give suppositories also. So that should be, we have to be mindful of our traditional method, uh, method of medications to relieve constipation. Yes, as Rajeshri says, it's a purgative actually. Um, I'm not very sure about, uh, L, what is LV pan? What does it contain? I'm not sure. What, what I suggest, Sukanya, she's uh, head of the department of uh, anesthesia and palliative medicine at Chandigarh Medical College. Uh, Panja, uh, Chandigarh. So, Sukanya, can you open your mic and say, ask what exactly it is? Because I think uh, nobody has heard this about this medication or anyone has any idea about this medication. Sukanya, can you open your mic, please? Uh, madam, this is also a peripheral uh, opioid receptor um, agonist, and it uh, this molecule was uh, like you know uh, it was in the uh, I would say like uh, in the lab actually. So just because they gave such an erudite lecture, so I wanted to know like is alvimopan available because nowadays mostly na methyl naltrexone is what that is used. No, I don't think that it is available, Gayatri, or anyone has any idea about this medication. I think Shobha, I can see. Shobha, do you have any idea about this medication available in India? Um, hi, Sushma, thank you. No, I don't. Uh, I'm not sure. So it, I don't okay. know whether that is a generic name or a trade name. No, no, is this is a, this, uh, no, 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 no. This is uh, actually pharmacological and mm -hmm. uh, uh, like... Uh, uh, it's yet to probably be released. Uh, it was actually in the papers because uh, uh, peripheral opioid, uh, like uh, these things were coming in a very big way. But I'm sorry I asked this question and distracted. I think no, I'll find it out okay. and uh, let, uh, let everybody okay, so know we, the house. Yeah. I, I know that at least we know this name. Uh, okay, so there are two more questions. Gayatri, one you missed that uh, people... Uh, who wants to ask that uh, that what is the drug used for C rectum because C rectum people keep struggling that what to which laxative to be used. Uh, it this question has been asked by Debjani Deb Paul. So I, I was wondering like why this specifically you mean to say because there is a obstruction that you're worried that you were um, asking about uh, use of laxative. Uh, if you're thinking about obstruction. I think we have to go back to our session on malignant bowel obstruction. Most of these obstructions are partial obstruction. It's not still complete obstruction. So normally when we deal with that obstruction, like symptoms and constipation, then we have to look at, look at how, how, is there any way pharmacologically we can overcome that obstruction? When I say that, I mean like using steroids and, um, and overcoming the peritumor edema and, and relieving the obstruction. Because most of the time it is partial, still a partial obstruction. So we do that and then we add stimulant laxative. So it, we can still use it. And of course we, we can add so lubricant laxative. But remember that when, even though I said most common obstruction is partial obstruction and what, what aggravates that obstruction is impaction and constipation. So we have to actually ag actively manage constipation in those patients. We should not stop uh, managing constipation. If they progress to com complete obstruction, 
no flatus, complete obstruction, then of course we have to be mindful of uh, using la stimulant laxatives. I hope Dr. I. Yes, yes. Dr. Kalpana has some answer about LV morphone. Dr. Kalpana, uh, she uh, she wants to say, Dr. Kalpana, can you open your mic and say, please? Dr. Kalpana is heading the Department of uh, Anesthesia and Palliative Medicine at, uh, um, at Chennai, uh, ADR Cancer Institute, Chennai. Dr. Kalpana, please go ahead, open your mic. Madam, I have, I have opioid producing constipation and colorectal cohort in a review where they say there are some studies going on, but I do not know whether it's available in our country. Okay, Dr. Kalpana. Sushma, can I add something, please? Yes, please. Um, Sushma. Yeah, go yeah. ahead. Sushma. Um, so I was just going to say uh, when Gayatri said the steroids, because sometimes even uh, uh, when they have constipation and even if you have tried all sorts of things, uh, sometimes a small shot of steroids help because of fecal impaction. There might be like fecal it's up, which is obstructing. And uh, so you have this higher enemas, which we normally use. Um, and a small shot of steroids might help. Uh, they would say that they are moving the bubbles, but they struggle with it. So uh, there's no distension or anything, but we don't get that kind of obstruction uh, sort of a picture. But uh, uh, steroids uh, help and if when everything fails so that we have tried of course and the other thing that I wanted to add um, is uh, early olden days in western countries they used to use arachis oil retention enema uh, which is not being used nowadays so they used to give overnight retention where they would ask the patient to lie down flat uh, so that it works for the next 12 hours or so and then uh, they have a good bowel movement. Um, that used to be the scenario around uh, maybe 15, 20 years ago. But uh, nowadays, we hardly see that being used, Arakas oil retention. And I don't know whether it is because of the uh, uh, problem in using it and the trouble it gives the patient or soils, the bed linen and things like that. I'm not sure about that, but that practice is not there. So uh, whether castor oil can be used like that, I'm not sure. So just wanted to add those two points. Thank you, Shobha. I think in terms of enema, uh, a lot of things are tried by people, but definitely using um, uh, soap water enema, which, which used to be the standard practice in most of the public hospitals in India, it's like no more it's recommended because it can be very irritant and also a lot of water inside can cause absorption and hyponatremia and other problems which can come from, which can come with that and in the west i've also seen people use coffee uh, as a stimulant uh, for edema so various things are tried and of course please again i emphasize this thing that about uh, uh, ayurvedic practice they have many purgatives which they use um, and as enema uh, or uh, suppositories I see one, one, one more response, prokinetics in constipation. If prokinetics, yes, sometimes we use prokinetics like uh, metoclopramide in combination with, um, uh, with uh, stimulant laxative. But remember that metoclopramide works only in upper GI. Uh, it may not work over um, the lower part of GI. That's the reason this newer drugs like um, uh, 5-HT4 receptor um, uh, agonist, um, antagonist, uh, like... Um, um, what we say, um, cisapride or brucalopride. Brucalopride is something very uh, often these days mentioned in most um, GI uh, um, uh, uh, related papers. They're talking about it. I have not used it, but this is the in thing now, brucalopride, HD4 receptor antagonist, uh, which uh, they're using. Uh, this is a prokinetic. It works all over the GI tract and it works as a prokinetic. I see lactulose, Dr. Rajeshree's comment uh, given as enema. I have not used it. Okay, Rajeshree, that's new news to me. Lactulose being given as enema. Interesting. Yeah. Entoform uh, enema. Entoform uh, enema. I think that's mostly we. Um, uh, Shobha, any comments around that entoform enema? We use radiation proctitis, we, I think, most of the time. We, yeah. Uh, yeah, so I think uh, it has uh, steroids in it and that, that's again used as a retention enema when there is proctitis. Um, so uh, rectal area, uh, if it can hold, and the patient again like uh, needs to lie down flat and um, 
like in Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, they use uh, um, steroid enema, so something like that. So um, like Rajasri said, uh, lactulose is being prescribed for especially hepatic encephalopathy. We have a lot of HCC patients in Kerala, uh, so hepatocellular carcinoma. So uh, they go into um, hepatic encephalopathy and uh, to reduce that, that's only an indication why in palliative care we use lactulose uh, as a laxative. We all know that it produces a lot of gaseous distension and we prefer other forms of laxatives, but this is one indication for lactulose. Uh, even orally, and it is also given as a kind of bubble wash so that the ammonia, everything comes down and the people actually wake up when we've seen that. So it's used um, in, 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 in Amrita. So Enterform uh, is again, I think it is steroids and it can be used as recognition enema. Uh, thank you, Shobha. That, uh, that was very useful to know. Yeah. Uh, one thing which has uh, caught a lot of attention, in fact, that is uh, um, becoming the drug of choice, especially in pediatric age group, but even in adult is uh, uh, microgol related uh, medications, polyethylene glycol uh, medications. They have oral preparations also. And that's becoming the mostly the most commonly used drug of choice in outside palliative care constipation. But we do use it sometimes, uh, many, many times, many intractable uh, constipation. Uh, I want to hear from others any experience around use of that. So Miralax tablets are available because that is a routine I see in the, in the um, US, they write Miralax for almost every patient when they are dealing with constipation, which is polyethylene glycol group of uh, medications. In pediatrics, I think for them, it's that's the first drug uh, line of uh, medication. Are you using it routinely or only for uh, more constipation patients? I, I wonder how others are using it. Rajeshri, Shobha. So Gayatri, I can't see any other. Uh... So Gayatri, hello. Yes, yes, Kushma. Uh, yeah. uh, okay, there is one more question from Dr. Preeti about uh, pediatric constipation uh, uh, okay. that that pediatric constipation again it's a um, I, I can have another discussion around that actually but generally I, I would like to say same principle focusing on non-pharmacological aspect of management uh, especially their, uh, um, their habits of fixing the time and allowing the child not to, uh, making encouraging the child not to hold because they hold and they become constipated. They don't move all on time. And, and, and when they want to do it, they don't do it. Often because of fear, they may have some uh, rectal injury or something painful and they just hold and then that leads to constipation. So looking at non-pharmacological aspect is very important. In terms of pharmacological aspect, again, uh, the drugs very, not very good studies around use of laxatives in children, actually. There's no proper evidence, but whatever evidence they have, they talk about, again, uh, polyethylene glycol microgol, a group of drugs. They use uh, bisacodyl and they use more commonly, which I've seen in Indian pediatric group is use of a lot of lactulose. Uh, but again, remember that it may not be very useful for our, our opioid-induced constipation. We should rather go for uh, again, um, uh, stimulant laxatives like bisacodyl in opioid induced constipation. Uh, dosage of cremaffin, cremaffin plus in children. Yes, we can use, but there are concerns around too much of magnesium and, um, uh, and, and uh, yeah, mostly magnesium uh, in children. So, but we can still use it. And so Shobha says, uh, no experience with me relax, yeah. So <laughs> thank you, Gayatri and Arjun. I think we had a very good discussion. A lot of points have come out. And uh, as Ga Dr. Gayatri has clearly mentioned, and I think this is very important for all the residents that explaining relatives, explaining patient about the doses and the uh, quantity of doses is very important. Patients are going to be constipated whenever, especially in oncological setup. And it's not only only because of morphine. Uh, as Dr. Uh, Dr. Gayatri has mentioned that oncologists are going to say that patient is already having constipation, don't prescribe morphine. But <clears throat> it does not mean that we will remain a deprived patient from pain management. Even with morphine, we, 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 
opioid rotation we can do but even with morphine we can handle constipation very well provided we have explained them properly about the doses and uh, about the dietary uh, dietary instructions so thank you gayatri uh, if there are no comments i think we can stop here thank you gayatri and dr arjun for an excellent presentation and very good discussion and thank you dr shobha dr garashri and sukanya for uh bringing some new points and pranit for asking questions and residents for asking questions it was so good to hear from you that you are asking and you are actively participating and uh today is buddha purnima have, have a nice day and have a um, happy buddha purnima and good enjoy your day and enjoy your week thank you sushma like the last last sentence yeah, yeah. You... I say thank you ibc is a real fee feast like academic feast actually what we have this on monday thank you yeah. thank you very much bye